Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Dante Uma. I'm co-founder and uh, humanitarian solutions advisor for an organization called the Worldwide Tribe. And I'm gonna try and tell you how, says I've got what? One second, oh no, okay, we're good. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna try and tell you how this all came about because it was by accident. So it began in Calais, August 2015. Um, in the news, we were seeing all these reports, migrants swarming into Europe. These people are coming to invade Europe. The, 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 the media was kind of really hitting hard. A message that me and my friends were kind of quite uncomfortable with. You know, it literally looked like this, like what you see in the wall behind me. So we were like, okay, what should we do? Let's go to Calais, there's a refugee camp there. Let's just drive. Everyone was like, you're crazy. You're gonna go, it's, it might be really dangerous. Anyway, we carried on. We, I lived in Kent, so it was very easy to get to, uh, to Calais. So an hour and a half from my house, um, we were in a refugee camp, 2,000 people, no NGOs, just people in the back of a chemical plant filled with asbestos, no support. Um, as soon as we walked into the camp, we were really you know, surprised at the warm welcome that the, the people were kind of giving us. You know, we sat down with them, we drank tea, we drank coffee, and we really relaxed, and we started speaking to all the different communities, people from Eritrea, people from Ethiopia, people from Sudan, and try to understand what, you know, their journey was. Why, why are they here? Where do they want to go? I used to go off on my own, and I just used to sit down with people, drink loads of coffee. By the end of the day, I used to have like nine, ten coffees, because like force it on you, and you're like, drink, drink, drink. So I would be like, uh, talking to all the different people and finding out their hopes, their dreams, their fears. And pretty much the same as ours, really. Like, the only difference is, is that some of these people come from a very difficult situation. So we started spending a lot of time in the camp. We used to go there every day and try and bring some aid, um, some clothes, some shoes. After the first visit, uh, my friend put a post on Facebook just about the day, just like you or I would put a post on Facebook. A few days later, it was shared 65,000 times. It went viral. We were like, what's going on? This is crazy. So we thought, OK, let's ask for 1,000 pounds. We asked for 1,000 pounds. Within a month, we had nearly a quarter of a million pounds. And you know, I was like, I wake up in the morning, there'd be 50,000 pounds in the crowdfund. I'd be like, oh my god, what am I going to do with all this money? What are we going to do? You know, we didn't plan this. This wasn't a position that we, you know, were, were thinking about. But there, were, there was obviously a need, and people wanted to help, and we put ourselves in that situation. So we started the Worldwide Tribe. After about a month, a lot of organizations went to Calais, and we decided that um, we wanted to collect some more aid, and we ended up filling up seven warehouses in London, over 100 tons of aid. We had Nic Nicola Bennett, the leader of the Green Party, was helping us, volunteering. Um, we had 450 volunteers in a sorting day. This all happened within a month. My life was like so crazy. I was like, you know, what has brought me to this moment? Um, but I knew that it was probably what I was going to be doing for the rest of my life. So after that month, when we had all this aid, I thought, OK, I want to go to Greece. I need to understand the situation over there, because that's where people are coming in. I went to a place called Lidomeni on the uh, Greece-Macedonia border. And when we arrived, I saw a few NGOs and about 3,000 people on the border. At 6.30 in the evening, the NGOs clocked off and they went home. The buses kept on coming. There were six volunteers, and I was one of them. And there were thousands of people that were arriving, arriving at the border, arriving at the border. We were handing out water, bread, we started running out of food, so then we started halving a pack of biscuits, started having to ration the water. And it was face upon face upon face, mother, child, grandmother, grandfather, father. It was, it was, it was a pretty, um, it was my first kind of experience of seeing this mass movement of people. You know, someone said to me, it was kind of, it, before I went, that, it, that it's biblical. I didn't kind of quite really realize until I was there and I started seeing the people. People like you or I. These families were waiting to cross uh, into Macedonia. They had um, 
You know, some of them had no shoes, some of them didn't have enough clothes, some of them were sick, some of them had, um, were wheelchair bound, but didn't have wheelchairs. So, so, um, so yeah, it was, uh, it was very eye-opening for me. After that period, um, I decided to head to Lesbos, which is the entry point. 1.1 million refugees entered Europe in 2015. 650,000 passed through Lesbos, an island population of 88,000. So you can imagine the strain that had on the island. I went to uh, work with an organization called PICPA. PICPA was a camp for vulnerable refugees. They used to look after um, people with chronic conditions, people with disabilities who had made the journey, maybe a child who'd lost his mother, father, brother and sister at sea, maybe a day before. These people weren't really fit to be going into the normal camps, so PICPA was a camp for vulnerable refugees that was being run by international global volunteers, which was absolutely beautiful because it was all grassroots run, it was donations, and it was people from all over, all over the world coming together to support our fellow uh, man, woman, to support each other. Whilst I was working there, I started, um, I was approached by a Canadian guy, and he said, hey Dan, do you want to come with me to the beach tonight because um, I'm going to go and help out with a boat. So I was like, okay, I'd seen it in the news. So we got in his Fiat Panda, full of water, blankets, and we went to the beach. It was just me and him. We were looking at the horizon, four o'clock in the morning, I see the, we see the first boat coming in really, really fast. Down at the bottom by, by the cliff, we start running down, you know. We're, I was just like, seen this in the news, and now I'm here. This is a crazy situation. We get to the boat, and the people start disembarking. The boat was full of about 60, 70 people. It's only fit for about 20 people. Uh, people were really scared. Some people were really scared. Some people were really happy. They'd finally got away from the situation back in Syria. So for them, it was a good moment. For me, it was kind of like, it's crazy that someone like myself or like this guy is having to be here to help these people get off these boats. Where is everyone else? And in some nights, it used to be about 30 boats, 70 people per boat. You can do the math, that's a lot of people. Um, no organizations, grassroots volunteers from all over the world. Um, what experience do I have in search and rescue or in rescue? None at all. All I know is uh, I was brought up in El Guari. Four or five years old, I was swimming all the time, up to the boy, off the pier. And I was there, the same as the next person, you know? After um, we, we were in Lesbos, we decided to head further east to Izmir, to Turkey, to try and understand the situation over there. We started working with around 250 uh, Syrian families who, again, had zero support. And, um, you know, a lot of people really ask me, it's, they really tell me, you know, it's so good that you do this work, it's, it's amazing. But actually, what they give me is far more than any one of us could ever give them. They teach me about love, about courage, about ambition, about fear, about anger, more than I ever have done in the previous 28 years of my life. It's something that we don't really look at. We don't really look at the human aspect, the human element of this. The first thing that we normally do is look at the political aspect or the religious aspect. But we very quickly in this day and age forget about the human element, about leading with love, with empathy, with compassion. And when you do that, you break down barriers and you break down borders. And I think it was important for me to come here and to, to talk about this because I feel like Gibraltar is a very multicultural community. It is still, you know, quite closed off. We live in a bubble here in Jib, so it's very important, well, it was important for me to come here and share this kind of thing with you because we can kind of relate to that. But I think it's also important to bring further information about what is happening in these places because it's not what you see in the news, it's not what you see in the newspaper. I only found out because I put myself in that situation. So after getting all of this experience in Lesbos, I was asked to consult for a search and rescue organization in Wales. Again, I was like, wow, how's my life taken me to this, uh, to this, to this uh, place? Did some training in Wales. Went back to Greece. Most of the refugees in the Greek islands were moved into the, to the north, to Thessaloniki. 
There's about 35,000 refugees in the north of Greece at the moment living in warehouses. Uh, some of these warehouses are battery hen warehouses where they used to keep chickens, tents full of it. This actually looks quite nice. Um, but, you know, sometimes there's no water, there's no food, and um, it's a pretty difficult situation. Out of sight, out of mind, this is why they're in warehouses. So many times I've thought to myself, we're in Europe, and these kind of situations are happening. I do feel for Greece under an economic crisis. How are they supposed to? Uh, how, how are they supposed to deal with this situation? It's a global responsibility. It's a European responsibility. All of us need to come together and do our bit. And I'm not just saying send money or send aid. I'm talking about awareness, about talking to each other, about making sure you have the right access to information when it comes to this subject. So um, after Thessaloniki, I went, I went and did a mission in the Med between uh, Malta and Libya. I joined an organization called Sea Watch. There's been over 5,000 deaths in the last few years in the Med, people drowning every single day. But there is sometimes beauty within the madness. Um, you know, I want to go back to how the community comes together. On the ship, there was nationality, people from, from all over the world. I was working with um, people from Spain, from Base Vasco, from Catalonia, from America, from Canada, from Germany. All of these people coming together to just help. And that situation out at sea is black and white. You can either help or you can't help. Um, some of you may know or you may not know, but the ship that has rescued most people in the sea is registered in Gibraltar. It's called the MV Aquarius. And I'm looking at potentially going out and serving on that ship next year. But that's just a, you know, an example of how the community in Gibraltar, maybe knowing or not knowingly, has been able to support, because this ship has been, is, is, is out there, you know, saving these people. Oh. So after the mission, I headed back to Greece and started thinking about the issue in a kind of wider context. You know, I wanted to look at it in a, in a kind of more long-term solution, because we've only seen the tip of the iceberg. This is going to get worse and worse. The mass movement of people will get worse. Um, climate change, economics, and war are all intrinsically linked. There isn't just one issue. A lot of people say, oh, yeah, if you stop the wars, people will stop coming. That's not true. All of those are linked. So we need to start our long-term creative solutions to dealing with this situation and stop throwing money at it. Let's, let's try and get the wider community involved. You know, at the moment, we've been asked to run a camp in Thessaloniki. It's called Echo. It's a beautiful place. It's a creative community. And we're planning on turning it into a creative hub where we can work together with refugees from across the world, with volunteers from across the world, and try and help them with kind of the things that they enjoy doing in life, rather than just giving food, rather than just making them, you know, you're a refugee, I'm an NGO, or I'm coming here to help you. What are they interested in? Because psychosocial support and boredom are the biggest issues in the refugee crisis. So the Worldwide Tribe will, will be running a, a project called um, the ECHO Project, where we'll where we will be um, working with graphic designers, artists, musicians, poets, alongside the refugees, um, to create one community to try and bring some positivity, give people um, a future, hope for the future, and, and to kind of give them some form of direction. Echo is on private land, so it's a Greek guy. His wife has been terminally ill for 15 years, and he's given his land for us to build this project on which is absolutely amazing, considering Greece is under economic strife. It's given him a new lease of life. You know, having all of these people on his land, 200 to 300 refugees a day come to his house. They get food, they get to go on computers, they get to Skype their family back home. You know, these, the normal things that we do on a daily basis that we don't normally give out in, in the humanitarian sector, because we forget that they're actually human beings. So yeah, you know, moving forward within the ref refugee crisis, um, I'd, I'd recommend that we all work together with creative solutions, start working with a wider community. We're working with architects, we're working with IT technicians, 
um, from all over the world. Some people can give their time, some people can't give their time, so they send us information remotely from the US, from China. This is the way forward um, for the worldwide community to help in this situation. And the reason I wanted to come here is because I wanted to tell the people of Gibraltar, um, which is where I'm from, that every person can help, we can all be involved, and it doesn't just have to be kind of, you know, we don't kind of just have to like throw money at it, we can all be involved. So yeah, sorry, um, I couldn't go in more depth. The last 18 months has been absolutely crazy. Um, it has snowballed, but thank you for your time, and we're gonna try and, um, you know, do more talks, and, and I wanna try and bring you more information about what is actually going on, but that's kind of just a little bit of it. So yeah, thank you very much for your time. <laughs>